take your Bible and turn with me to uh, Proverbs chapter 31 this morning. Proverbs 31 this morning. And uh, I appreciate, uh, Brother Steve, uh, the music, the message, and the hour. I know the Livingstons were scheduled uh, to be singing today, but they are home ill today. And so he wasn't too bad for a substitute, you know. You, you bring up the substitute, you never know what to expect, but he did a good job. Proverbs 31 is really not where we're focusing for the message, but we are going to look at that for our scripture reading. And so I invite you to stand. Proverbs 31, I'm going to read verse 10, and then after that we're going to read together, beginning at verse 25. Proverbs 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman... For her price is far above rubies. Now let's read together at verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gate. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this inspiring uh, lesson that we find in Proverbs 31. Uh, of, a, of a woman that aspired to be virtuous, and her son, now in the Scripture, praises her. Lord, we have many women in this building today, perhaps many others, that are joining us online that are truly worthy of praise. Lord, we know that they would give you all the honor and all the glory. And for we realize that apart from you, Apart from your grace and apart from your mercies, we are nothing. We have nothing of which to boast. And yet in Christ, we have everything. And Lord, I pray today, may this uh, Mother's Day be a day of challenge. May it be a day of encouragement. Lord, may it be a day of change, not only perhaps as parents, but even as children, that we might understand the wonder of your perfect plan for man. Not only that of redemption in Jesus Christ, but even the influence of father and mother in the lives of our children. So Lord, thank you today for the truths that we'll study. Lord, I pray that we might be as a church, we might be as families, a beacon of light and truth, we pray. All this in Christ's name, amen. Thank you, you can be seated. I've titled the message today, Who is Teaching Johnny? Now, there's been a lot of debate about who should be teaching our children. Even the president decided in the last couple of weeks to weigh in on the matter, and he told a group of teachers that they were the shapers of the minds of children. Well, they only are if we, in any way, give up our divine responsibility as fathers and mothers. There's a wonderful poem that was written by William Ross Wallace in 1865. You will recognize the title today, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, but it was originally titled this, What Rules the World? The repeated refrain that is up here for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. In that poem is spoken four times. Four times it's repeated. And of course, the idea and the, ex and the challenge was to mothers. That mothers who are faithful in rocking the cradle are the ones that will shape the world. I am going to say some things today, not to discourage you, but some things today that I hope will challenge you as a mother to recognize the divine responsibility, the wonder of being able to, as a mother, to shape the heart and the mind of youth and to realize as you do so, 
You can change not only a life, but you can change the world. Just to let you know, there are politicians and despots over the years that were very much aware of the hand that rocks the cradle, rules the world. Adolf Hitler wrote these words, He alone who owns the youth gains the future. Communist revolutionary Vladimir Lenin writes, Give me four years to teach the children, and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. He then went on and said this, Give, me the, uh, give us the child for eight years, and it will be a Bolshevik forever. John F. Kennedy, quote, The future promise of any nation can be directly measured by the present prospects of its youth. Based on that quote, we're in big trouble. But we've got answers to troubles, don't we? I want to begin with, uh, you know, have you ever had anyone ask you, I have bad news and I have good news. What do you want first? My personality says, give me the bad news, right? Then give me the good news. So I'm going to give you the bad news. All right, here's the bad news. And I want you to write this down. It's on, your power, uh, on the PowerPoints, on your outline there. Here's the bad news. The traditional family in America is under assault by a liberal ideology that is anti-family, anti-God, and anti-America. Let me say that again. The traditional family is under assault by a liberal ideology that makes no mistake, it is anti-family, it is anti-God, and it is anti-America. I want to walk through philosophically some thoughts with you this morning. If you follow the news at all, you're very much aware that the federal, the state, and local governments are attacking civil liberties. Now, I want to describe for you what civil liberties are. All right, here's the thought. Our founding fathers in the declaration of our independence as a nation said these words, wrote these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident. There is no debate. This is the fact. This is the truth. That all men are created equal. And that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That is, rights that are not given to us, but that rights that belong to us. But the fact that we are humans and God created us. That among the unalienable rights are these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, I want to pause there. Not all of that was up there. The latter part, government derives its right from my consent. Government's reach is only as far as I'm willing to consent. Give it, uh, another thought, and I don't know if this is on your outline or not. Civil liberties, let's talk about that for a moment. Civil liberties are not granted by government to citizens, but are to restrain government from imposing its will on the governed. Let me say that again. Civil liberties are not meant to restrain us but are meant to put a restraint on government itself. One of my great regrets as a senior pastor is that I listened to the government in 2020. And in the panic of a pandemic, I closed the doors for eight weeks. I will never do that again. They will have to lock me up, but I will not ever again forsake my constitutional liberty. Let me give you the constitutional liberties. They are this. The, the first and second amendments are where I will focus. Freedom of speech. Freedom of press. Freedom of religion. Listen. Freedom of assembly. The right to petition the government for grievances. And number two, the second amendment. The right to bear arms. I am a concealed carrier. My wife has a concealed permit. 
You don't want to come into my house at night. It will look like the shootout at the OK Corral. All right? And by the way, I had some contact me about security. I encourage you this morning, if anybody disrupts the service, duck. Because this is a concealed carry permit church. From the back to the front and all through the lobby, all right? We make no apology for that. So if you want to know where the security is, you won't see it until we need it. And then you're going to see it big time, just in case I needed to say that. All right, let me walk through this. Civil liberties then. The second thing I want to present to you is this. Federal, state, and local governments are attacking parental authority like I have not ever witnessed in my life. There is a battle that is being waged, listen, for the minds and the souls of our children. And that enemy is embedded. It is embedded in the government. It is embedded in the courtrooms. It is embedded in the schools. And it is embedded in the culture. There is a battle for the heart and souls of your children and for your grandchildren. Do you know that? You know that, right? Mom and dad... This government doesn't care at all about getting your attention. They just want your children. If they get your children, they've got the nation, and they know that. The one thing I've learned about the enemy is that they are patient. You and I are, are always looking ahead a foot. Government looks ahead years, and they're saying, I will change and I will make you what I want to make you because they have the long vision. And sadly, too often we are short-sighted. I wanted to give you another thought before we really get into the scripture this morning. Author Tim LaHaye, he was a pastor, uh, wrote and published a book in 1980. The title of that book was The Battle for the Mind. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It is still in print. It is very much worth reading. In that book, The Battle for the Mind, I believe it was probably the first time that anyone presented what we know as humanism. And they presented it as, he presented it in such a way that he reminded us that there was an infiltration into every aspect of society. Let me walk through humanism. In essence, humanism does this. It rejects God. Number two, it rejects moral values. Number three, it rejects traditional family. If you look at our culture in America right now, all three of those things are under attack now. The rejection of God is a foregone conclusion of the society that we're living in. The rejection of moral values. How else can you explain a culture that decides one day in, that there will no longer be male and female, that there will be other things? I almost said it, but whatever it might be, you know. But no longer that. So there's a rejection of moral values. And then there is also the rejection of the traditional family. One of the, one of the, the great foundational stones of communism and socialism is to undermine the traditional family. The traditional family being father and mother. Now, in the book, The Battle for the Mind, LaHaye admonished the churches in 1980 that humanism was taken over the public school system. And the goal of humanism was to reshape American society. Would you agree that America today is not the America you knew 20 years ago? Would you agree? How did it dramatically change? How can one man become president in 2020 and we suffer as a nation? And it's a constant attack on our very values. How can that be? Here's the thought, and this is on your outline, I believe. We're witnessing the effect of six decades of humanist indoctrination. 
and a cultural shift that is anti-God, anti-family, and anti-America. That's what's happening. We are shifting. No longer the America that you and I love or one that is constitutional. Humanists have taken over the government, the federal government, the whole bureaucracy. You've heard it called the swamp. It is the whole bureaucracy. The state government, and I don't know about you, but I, I praise the Lord, we have a guy named Ron DeSantis. At least he has been somewhat of a, of a dam against insanity that is in all the other states, it would appear. Also, they've taken over the judicial system. You can't go to court anymore and trust that, they, that the judge himself or herself will obey the law. We have become a lawless nation. They control public education. They control entertainment. Humanists control social media. And they control the flow of news. They have done a total takeover. In fact, the last vestige of truth is the church. And most churches have compromised. You may have seen this past week, I believe it was. The President Biden, in all of his intellect and wisdom, presented the following as a new government entity. And it is the Disinformation Governance Board. You heard of that? What does that mean? It means shut up if the government doesn't want to hear you. Now, I know you're not supposed to say that. So parents are going to meet me at the back and say, <laughs> no, little Johnny's going to go out and say, shut up, shut up. And then one of you's going to write to me and say, Pastor, you said it. You, you know, anyway. Disinformation Governance Board. What does that mean? It means that government is assuming the authority to determine what truth is. They will put teeth in that assumption and will shut down what they disagree with. That's what that means. If you've ever read the book 1984, he was a little bit ahead of his time, but we've arrived there. Now, that was the bad news. Let me give you a little bit of good news on your outline. The founding fathers of our nation taught and lived by a principle that was called Republican virtue. Now, Republican not being the party, Republican being the description of individual liberty. Many of you are Baptists by choice. I am a believer who has chosen to be a Baptist. One of the cardinal principles of being a Baptist is individual soul liberty. The Methodists did not have that. The Presbyterians did not have that. The Catholics did not have that. But the Baptists believed in the individual soul liberty, the individual right of making choices. Now, let me walk you through Republicans' virtues, and I'm going to do it quickly, so I'm not going to take much time here, but there are three that I wanted to give you. The first is this. It is the conviction that self-government demanded self-discipline. Self-government demands self-discipline. Number two, self-discipline implied the existence of boundaries between that which is acceptable and that which is unacceptable. Between that which is good and that which is evil. That is the, the, the intent of that statement. Number three, Republican virtue assumes this, that it was the conviction of our founding fathers that moral values must be transmitted through moral indoctrination. So, when you look at the school system in America, the public school system, the secular university system, you're looking at a system 
that is dedicated to indoctrination. That's what teaching is. As I'm standing in front of you today, I am at the task of indoctrinating you. That you should be at the task of listening to what I say and then judging me by the truth. So there, there always has to be an absolute. So as you listen to me or anyone else teach, you should filter what I say through the absolute authority of God's Word. Now, with all of that said, let's go to the good news, all right? That was the heavy stuff. Now let's go to the good news. Here we go. The Scriptures. The Scriptures have answers to personal, family, and societal problems. If you want to fix America, if you want to fix your family, if you need to be fixed, you go to the Scriptures because the Bible is the answers to our problems. As an individual, as a family, as a society, as a nation, God is an answer. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. You might want to turn there, but the verse is going to be up here for you. Proverbs 22 and verse 6, we read, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I'm going to give you a personal observation. Have you ever noticed that the people who are experts on child training have never had children? <laughs> Do you remember before you had children that you would look at other people and you would look at their children and you had all kinds of ideas of how they ought to fix that problem, you know? Well, you know, when you have children, all of a sudden you realize you don't know as much as you thought you knew. Now, when I was growing up in the 50s, late 50s, and then on into the 60s, there was a guru self-appointed named Dr. Spock, right? Dr. Spock came out. I think he was the revolutionary. This is how you raise a generation of children. And 18 years later, we had the hippie movement. And you know that really went well for us, right? No, we're the products of it. So we know, look in the mirror and think, oh my, Dr. Spock, he's the one to blame for that. He's not the word. Now let me walk you through some things with this. There have been thousands of books and articles written about how to train children. How many of you as parents, when you were raising your children, and some of you are raising your children, but how many of you had books written by experts? Would you raise your hand? All across the congregation, all right? So we, we all had, had books, right? We would read articles and the things you do and the things that you shouldn't do. And, and if you do the wrong thing, well, then little Johnny is just going to be bent forever and it's going to be your fault. And by the way, as a parent, there are other parents that will be more than glad to tell you how to fix your problem. Your grandparents, probably, if they're wise, are going to bite their tongue. But there will be many that have an opinion. Well, let me take you to Proverbs 22 and verse 6 right here. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 is not a guarantee. It is a principle for parenting. It is a general truth. Now, let me tell you why that is the case. Little Johnny, and I'm going to keep saying little Johnny. I got little Johnny over here. Uh, little Johnny. <laughs> the bad thing is, he knows how to take just my thumb and put me on my knees crying, you know, so I can figure. All right. Little Johnny has what's called a free will. You know what that is? Somebody would say, yeah, it's stubborn. That's what it is, right? If we were able to go right now and visit the toddler nursery, where some of your angels are right now being taught, uh, we would be able to take a few moments, and soon we would see free will. Even though you, the parent, 
have been the perfect parent, and Johnny, as far as you know, is the perfect child, one day, one of the teachers is going to come to you and say, little Johnny did this. Not my Johnny. Johnny would never do that. Oh, Johnny would do that. Because Johnny has a free will. Now, my thought that goes with that, every child has a free will and will inevitably choose to embrace or reject parental instructions. Now, for moms and dads and grandparents that are here today, you can quit beating yourself over not being the perfect parent because you weren't the perfect parent. But your child survived. But they have a lifetime of choices. As much as you want to dictate the choices that a child makes, you cannot. But you do guide them in the choices. And so, one statement to moms and dads and grandparents. Get over being guilty. Except that we have all failed. We've all failed. I mean, how many of us this morning would say, as parents and grandparents, I wish I had a do-over of some things in life. Probably every one of us. There's some things that we would do different. But you know, at the time, we were who we were, and we were desiring the best, even though sometimes we were misguided. But your children and their wrong choices, now I'm talking about adult children, your adult children and their wrong choices are where they are because they've made those choices. I've been with people that were 70 and 80 years old. This is, this is true. And they're blaming their parents for how they turned out. Well, a little bit of math says, how many years do you, do you have left to blame parents who have been in the grave for the last 20 years? It makes no sense. But if you can go through life not bearing the responsibility of choices, you think somehow that makes things better, and it doesn't. As a son or a daughter, you have to accept you are where you are because of your choices. At some point, you have to stop blaming anyone else for the choices that you're making as an adult. So let's go back. Every child has a free will. And they will inevitably choose to either embrace or reject parental instruction. On your outline now, number three. Parents generally follow one of three philosophies of parenting. I think this is the sum of them. You might add others that are a little bit of a shade different, but I think the following will be pretty accurate. I think you'll agree. I definitely coming from the Scriptures. The first philosophy, I'm going to call it neglect. Neglect. Neglect abdicates parental responsibility. And it leaves the task to others. Neglect abdicates parental responsibility and leaves the task to others. Now, we're blessed to have a school here. And we're blessed to have many families that have their children in our school. But invariably, during the course of a year, something's going to happen with Johnny. I'm going to keep going with Johnny in the classroom. And a parent will say to Mrs. Henry or Pastor Peterman, well, I have my child at your school for you to fix that problem. Well, where is that in the Bible? It's not my Johnny, it's your Johnny. Johnny, I hope you're not going to be bent and twisted out of all this, you know. <laughs> Let me give you a verse. Here it is. Proverbs 29, verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself 
bringeth his mother to shame. Now, is that verse teaching child abuse? And the answer is no. But it is teaching correction. Correction takes two forms. One is there is that physical correction. And the other is a verbal correction. A balanced parent will use both of those tools in their arsenal to teach and train their child. Now, look at it again, Verse this verse. The rod and reproof give wisdom. So I'm going to turn it around to you and say, if you neglect corporal punishment and you neglect rebuke, you're left with what? A foolish child. And so we have to assume as parents the responsibility that the, there is the rod and there is the reproof. So, Pastor, what's the rod? Well, that really sounds bad. It might be something as simple as the spatula in your kitchen that makes more noise than it ever inflicts any kind of pain. All right? I don't know what you want to use. I can tell you what my dad employed. It was about 36 inches long. It seemed like it was four feet long, but it was about 36 inches long. And I had to bear some of the burden of his discipline, all right? By the way, was he a perfect dad? No, he'd be the first to tell you. Now, look again at this verse then. So in Proverbs 29 and verse 15, we have an exhortation and we have a warning. The exhortation is employ the rod and, and rebuke and you'll end up with a child that has wisdom. The warning is, Fail to employ the rod and rebuke, and mom will go through her life humiliated, is sorrowing, and despairing. Why? Because of the child's choices. Now, I'm going to walk further through this. The second philosophy. First philosophy, neglect the responsibility that you have as a parent to use the rod and reproof and correct your child. The second is this. It's what I call driving. Driving. Driving provokes children to anger and invites resentment. Driving employs or provokes children to anger and invites resentment. Now here's the verse. Ephesians 6 and verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, let me break that down for you before I go any further. Provoke not. It means don't be unreasonable. Don't be unreasonable. Don't discipline your children out of anger or out of frustration. When you discipline Johnny, you do so with a desire to train and teach. And so, provoke not your children to wrath. And so, as I was studying, I thought, well, what are some things that provoke a child to wrath? Let me give you four. There's many. Here's the first. One would be, and this is a little bit dangerous, but I'm going to say it, being overly protective. Being overly protective. My dad never went to school to rebuke the teachers for my getting punished. If I was punished at school, I didn't want to go home. Because the assumption of an adult was, if I was irresponsible at school, what you got at school, you're going to get when you come home. Being overly protective. Sometimes... You as a parent have to step back and let that child suffer the consequences of a bad choice. Now, in our culture, being overly protective is usually not where we err. We err on not being protective enough. But it would be possible as a believer, as a, as a, a mom and dad who is godly in your intent, it would be possible to be so overly protective that your children never learn to make decisions on their own. Now, 
when they make the wrong decision, what do you do? You step in, right? And then you correct it. Number two, I think another thing that would provoke a child to wrath would be being unreasonable in your expectations. Unreasonable in your expectations. For instance, you have a goal that Johnny is going to get straight A's. But maybe you need to accept that Johnny's not a straight A student. Because you could so drive that heart of that child to be something that they're not, that they, you end up frustrating them, and they become resentful, not only of you as a parent, but resentful of the whole process of teaching. Uh, another thought that goes with that, living your dreams through your children. Maybe you love music, and you love piano, and when you were growing up, you, you, you would practice piano for hours a day. But you have a child that has absolutely no interest in piano. And so what do you need to do? You need to find out where their interest is. And so as a parent, you want to be wise enough that you know your child's bent. You ever seen pictures or videos of parents at Little League Baseball or Little League Football? And, and, and the parents are just irate berating an umpire because, you know, my kid, you know, he, he, he made the wrong call or maybe berating a coach and the child withers. Maybe they don't even have an interest in baseball. Have you ever thought about that? But a lot of parents want to live their dreams through their children. So overly protective. Another is being unreasonable in expectations. Here's the third one, failing to affirm them. Failing to affirm them. You know, when a child grows up with constant criticism, they will develop a spirit that is cynical. When you fail to affirm or you compare them to others, compare them to the Peterman kids, for instance, you know, why can't you be more like Eric's kids? You know, why? Lord, why did you give me this? I mean, you know. So the fault finding. And then fourthly, provoking a child to wrath. Physical and verbal abuse. Physical and verbal abuse. Angry. Resentful. Feeling inconvenience because of something your children want or something they do. And so you, you berate them. And as a result of doing that, you provoke a resentment that they'll carry and could carry till they're 70, 80 years old. So as parents this morning, you are going to be one of three philosophies. One is neglect of just being a parent. And I, I, I admire, in this culture, I admire grandparents who sometimes step in parent where their children have failed. I admire single mothers that are left having to be the mother and the father because their spouse has failed. So we've got neglect. We have the being expecting too much Failing to affirm abuse, number four, uh, number three, guiding. This is Proverbs 22, 6. Proverbs 22, 6 is really stating this, guide the heart of your children. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let me give you some thoughts underneath that and the little bit of time I have. By the way, the clock here says that it's still 11.15, but that can't be right, can it? I think we need a new clock, brother. Come up with 10 bucks and we'll get a new clock. All right, here we go. Let me walk you through this quickly, all right? Guiding, number one, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6, verse 4. What is to bring? It is to provide for, to nourish 
to satisfy it. It is literally to bring is to bring along like a shepherd. The responsibility of a father and a mother, listen, is to shepherd the heart of your children. Nurturing them, providing for them, and guiding them. Now, Ephesians 6, 4 gives us the two thoughts here. Nurture and admonition. The word nurture is the word for discipline. It is to train. It is literally to correct. Or to punish. So it's interesting here. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurturing them in this godly discipline. And then in the admonition. Admonition is the rebuke. So in Ephesians 6 and verse 4, you actually have working both of the sides of the rod and the reproof. The nurture is the rod and the admonition is the reproof. So in your parenting arsenal, you have the two tools. One is the corporal, and the other is the verbal. But you must employ them both if you're going to be a parent that has any hope of having children that will walk in a way that is true and upright. Let me give you some other verses. Proverbs 29 and verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom. Proverbs 29 and verse 17. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give uh, give delight unto thy soul. Now, Proverbs 29 verse 17. Here's the thought I would have with that. If you don't correct your son now, you'll go through much of your life unrest, anxiety, sorrow, overcome with grief. So we have, as a parent, we have a mandate that we're looking beyond the moment, we're looking down the road. We're looking when they're making their own life's decisions. Sheila and I are in that place now. We have absolutely no control over the choices our children make. And sometimes that is just so hard. Because I want to fix it. It's my nature, right? I'm going to fix it. Yeah. And Sheila says, oh, no, you're not going to fix it. You know, it's, it's difficult not being the Holy Spirit. It just is, all right? It just, it just is. So let me, let me wrap up today. Proverbs 22, 6. What does it all mean? Here we go. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Here's what it means. When a child is consistently guided on a path, they will generally follow that path in life. When there is a consistent direction that a mom and a father are guiding their children, children will generally follow that path in life. So train up a child is to direct them. It's that hands-on. Now, I've given this illustration before, but I think I, I, I need to give it again. Before there was Gerber food, Before there was that puree of green peas, a mother would teach her children to eat solid food by doing what? Chewing on the food themselves and then giving it to the child. So why were they doing that? Well, one, there wasn't Gerber food. So there wasn't a puree. There wasn't a blender. There wasn't a bullet in the kitchen. There was the mother. And she knew that that little one growing up needed something more than mother's milk. There was a time in life that that little one needed to develop a taste for solid food. Why? Because that solid food would nourish that growing child. And so train up literally is to chew and then to feed. So as a mother and as a father, training up a child is a matter of you walking out personally 
what that child needs spiritually. They will never develop a taste for spiritual truth unless they've seen you as a father and a mother chewing on it. And then feeding them the way he should go on the right path. The path of righteousness. The path that says this. Now listen as I near my clothes here. Johnny needs to know he's a sinner. Johnny needs to know that when there is an evil report that Johnny pulled Sally's hair in the nursery, that that's not okay. Johnny needs to know when he stole the cookies out of the cookie jar in the kitchen and then he lied about it, that's not okay. Johnny needs to learn that he is a sinner. Yes, your child. They need to know that there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good. They need to know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They need to know that innate within their nature is the fallen nature of of a lost sinner. And mom and dad can debate all they want about whether or not the children are like the mother or like the father. But the answer to the question is, they're like both of you. They're sinners. So they need to know that they're sinners. Secondly, they need to know that sin is punished. Now this is chewing on the solid food. And so how does Johnny know that sin is punished? By your administering the rod and the reproof. So that's the basic chewing of the solid meat. So we've got Johnny, you're a sinner. Number two, Johnny, sin is punished. Number three, but God is loving. And he has a plan of redemption. Now, that's a big word, but you understand. He has a substitute. Johnny, he has someone that took your place and was punished for your sin. And that someone is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who loves you. Now, Johnny, you need to know that God offers his forgiveness to you through Christ. But you must be willing to accept. Every parent should have the heart and the intent of bringing their child to the point of salvation. That is your focus to train them, guide them, to chew on the solid food until they come to a point that they begin to make the right choices. Now, I wish I could say in life, you know, the smoothie shops and all. Have you ever looked at how much, how many calories are in a smoothie? You know, oh, I'm on a diet. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and get a smoothie 800 calories later, right? Um, I, 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 my granddaughter up in um, Pennsylvania, I don't know if she's had a little taste of a milkshake yet or not, but it wouldn't hurt, would it? Well, it might at this point, because you'll develop a taste for something that is not good for them. They need a taste for things that aren't good for them. Now, I need to close. Let me close with some mandates, and I, I think I maybe have four here. Here's the, the thought. As a parent, you have a divine mandate, two things. You're responsible for teaching and discipling your sons and daughters. Number two. You are accountable for both who and what your children are taught. Now you need to park there for a moment. As a parent, I'm responsible for teaching and discipling my children. Number two, I'm accountable as a parent for both who 
and what my children are called. Secondly, on your outline as we close, parents must answer two fundamental questions. Who is teaching Johnny? When your children go to school, they're in a public school. Who's teaching your children? Because you catch what you observe. And I have news for you. In our school system, it is full of people that would capture the heart of your children to turn them away from God and turn them away from you. I have wonderful public school teachers in this building, and they are the exception. I have to admit it, you are. You're the exception. Are they all enemies, Pastor? Absolutely not. But you need to be aware that the foundation philosophically of the public school system in America is anti-God, anti-family, and it's anti-American now. It's what it has become. You also need to be careful when your children are in a private school of who and what they're being told. We do all we can at Hillsdale to monitor who we hire. We, I, I saw a school this past week put a help wanted sign out at the road. And it's like, I would never do that. I'd rather close the school before I did that. Because they're going to accept whoever comes in off the street and wants to teach. No, I, I want people that share a biblical worldview. That's who I want for our children. And then finally, I, I want to close with what is Johnny being taught? And I've got just a moment, I think. Clock says 1126. So. Would you turn to Deuteronomy 6 and I will close. I promise this will be it. Would you turn to Deuteronomy 6 with me this morning? And I don't know if you can find it up there or not. But what were the parents of Solomon's day, what were they teaching their children? Because what they were teaching is what I should be teaching and what you should be teaching. You have your Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here's the word of the Lord. Now, these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. That you might do them in the land whether you go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord, revere the Lord thy God, Keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou, thy son, thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Now notice in verse 2, how many, go back to verse 2, how many generations are in verse 2? Three generations. So as, as parents and grandparents, there's a three-generation view. Thy son, or command thee, thy son, and thy son's son. As a grandparent, and I look at Tanya, her mom and dad are here today. As, as grandparents, they have a generational view. When those grandkids come along, it's happy days, and then it's oh me. Right? Because there's a generational heart that a godly parent has for their children and their grandchildren. Notice uh, also then, verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that you may increase mightily. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest, by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, that they shall be as frontlets before thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. What, what you see there is the heart and the passion of a godly people determined to instill in their children a love for God. 
They knew that it's not something that comes natural. It is something that must be indoctrinated. It is something that must be instilled. It is something that there must be a constant pattern of teaching and directing and guiding. Neglect the task and it will not be well with thee. Expect somebody else to pick up that task and it's not going to go well for thee. Be difficult and hard and unloving. Raising expectations that can never be met, and it will not go well with thee. But if the heart of a mom and a dad and hearts of grandparents can be, then I am going to guide you by chewing on the solid food myself and invite you to follow me. And what is the result of that? It's the promise. It will be well with you. In fact, if we went over to Exodus today, Exodus chapter 20, not only should you obey and honor your parents, but that it may be well with thee and you may live a long life. I, I've stood at the graveside over the years of, of parents mourning the loss and the death of a child. And invariably, almost every time I will hear at some point when a parent has buried a child, and it might be a child that is older, it might be a very young child, but they'll say, it shouldn't be like this. The mama and the father, they ought always die before their children. But the fact is this, sometimes it's in God's benevolent plan that a child would be taken home to him early. We have to accept that. But there are other times that children will make bad and evil choices. Failing to embrace the, the heart and the love that children have for God. And as a result of that, their life is traumatically difficult and one of sorrow. As a parent, we watch with longing and in prayer that our children will choose to walk in righteousness, to obey the commandments to love the Lord with all our heart at an early age to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and choose to walk in His likeness. When you've done that, my friend, you have done that which not only honors God, but you have chosen to be a wall, a battlement of protection between the world that would desire to destroy your child and a loving God who desires to bless them. It's about it.